Cameron Turner. Cameron, how are you, sir? Doing well, David. Glad to be here. I'm uh, glad you're here as well. Tell me, what do you do for a living? Well, uh, I work at a company called Kin and Carta. We're a publicly traded consultancy headquartered in London and Chicago, um, and we do a lot of work on digital transformation. My job as the VP of data uh, is basically helping our clients understand uh, what solutions are out there and mapping uh, their opportunities to those solutions, and then building things uh, really is, is fundamentally it. Uh, sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, how many of your solutions involve artificial intelligence? Well, you know, I, my area of the business is, is all about uh, data and AI. Um, mm -hmm. And we like to think about, you know, data and AI as sort of a continuum. Um, a lot of, you know, almost every company has, has data. So that's kind of the fun part of, of my job is we never go in with a true cold start because uh, organizations have already collected and stored data, and a lot of times they're wondering what to do with it. So that's really where the fun begins. Um, and so the AI piece, uh, you know, for us is really about understanding what the, the opportunity is to generate value. So initial modeling against that data, understand, you know, is it predictive of the kinds of things we want to look at? Um, is it uh, giving us answers that we can trust? Um, and now with, you know, generative AI, we have a whole uh, new set of tooling that we can apply to those kinds of questions. You mentioned a couple of things, predictive and generative. Uh, can you define those? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we've sort of graduated over the years, you know, from systems that were purely analytic. So looking at facts, not much prob you know, probability incorporated into it, into machine learning context and AI context. AI is an umbrella concept that would include natural language processing, uh, supervised learning, where you have the answers, unsupervised learning, where you don't have answers and you're trying to build clusters and those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, uh, large language models, things that are working with, you know, uh, uh, semi-structured data, including things like video and photos and, and those kinds of things, which actually most, most companies have that stuff. A lot of them don't think about it as data that can be used to train a model. Uh, but what we can now do uh, with generative AI um, is build systems that not only um, are predicting, uh, you know, an outcome, and then the humans all take action based on that prediction. Um, but actually can be a part of the, the generation process as well. So the product itself uh, becomes a part of that. And a lot of this isn't new. You know, we've had this even in areas like music where you could, you know, turn on a, a station and, and it would sort of be generating music that you like continuously. Um, but I think it's really started to spark the imagination as we've gone over the threshold of the Turing test. People are starting to see what the value is of uh, systems that can generate compelling content that solve real business needs. Oh, interesting. So uh, I guess I phrased the question in the sense that maybe they were uh, distinct things, predictive AI, generative AI, but what you're telling me is they're, they're actually, there's a blend between the, there's a lot of crossover between the two. I think that's right. It's different math um, that we're talking about and, and uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, different source data uh, that you're working with. Um, but I think the thing that's captured the imagination of everyone is the element of surprise that generative AI can surprise you with what feels like very wise answers. Um, and it calls into some very philosophical, you know, questions of very philosophical um, topics like what is creativity? You know, if we think about, you know, from the Renaissance on, you know, great, great artists, are we always building on what was there um, prior? Um, do we have, you know, cases where true creativity comes completely out of the blue or are we always, you know, stacking things up, which is something that generative AI does um, explicitly is capture a history and then generate forward based on that history. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a conversation I've had many times in terms of uh, responsible AI. You know, mm -hmm. clearly things, tools like DAL-E or OpenAI or ChatGPT, they're, they only know what they've read and they're mm -hmm. <laughs> creating new content based on that. But I only know what I've read. I only know what I've seen. And I'm basing a lot of my content on that. I'm influenced yeah. by that as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think one of the differences, um, going back to your questions, is you know, when you have generative AI, you're creating new combinations, so things that didn't exist before. Yeah. That can be a very, um, you know, a, a very exciting thing if you look at what's happening, uh, you know, right now in pharmaceuticals and AI influenced uh, research. Um, you know, finding new molecules that can solve specific um, you know, specific issues. 
Um, but it also, you know, as you started to allude to there, it, you know, it brings into some to some very important ethical questions as well, because you don't have a baseline necessarily to test against. Um, so in all industries, as we were going through this, you know, could you let uh, generative AI loose on, you know, a million uh, products and generate product descriptions for all of them and then deploy those? Um, one of our clients is doing exactly that. Um, yes, you can, but can you uh, do that without having any sort of human curation in that process? No, you absolutely can't. And the same is true in, in healthcare and, and you, know, you could say probably in the arts and other places as well. We need to keep humans around in order to really guide and tune um, output, albeit with much more productivity but, um, you know, and, and a different job, but very much um, in that role of being uh, sort of the guardian uh, you know, of, of these systems. Oh, I totally agree. I, in fact, I, I've been using the AI tools a lot recently. There's been a bunch of co-pilots released and I go to chat GPT and you talked earlier, it's probabilities. It's, it's not always a hundred percent, right? I need mm -hmm. to proofread. If I tell it to create uh, uh, an email for me, I'm not going to send, hit send until I've read the email and confirmed that it actually is correct. That's right. Yeah. We're on this uh, pendulum where, you know, I think with uh, GPT-3 and ChatGPT launch, we all swung forward in, in sort of the euphoria of, you know, volume <laughs> content. And then there was sort of this backswing or backlash uh, when we started to see hallucinations, even, you know, relatively basic math problems that, um, you know, ChatGPT was getting getting wrong. But I think that, you know, if we think about, um, you know, hallucination as a, as a term and instead think about it as, as you know, probabilities, as you say, then we're more on the right track because really that's the, that's the focus of these tools is to do a best, uh, a best guess based on the priors. And, um, you know, oftentimes a guess can be, can be wrong. Um, so we'll find some balance, I think, in that swing as we recognize that it's, you know, it can be great at improving productivity and throughput, but there is still, you know, work uh, to be done in order to get to true solutions. Yeah, and there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of approaches, and there's a lot of uh, different types of AI. What 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 kind of um, questions do you ask when you're deciding what solutions you're going to bring to your customers? Yeah, love that question. Um, really, for us, we try to listen at Ken and Carta as much as, as anything with clients, because I think the listening um, is really where uh, the answer to that question comes from. One thing I will say is that even the you know, most non-technical executive that we might work with uh, will still have fantastic intuition about the potential of what their data could be doing for the business. And so that that listening piece and really understanding, you know, what is the perceived opportunity? What is the gap that's seen today? Um, what are the challenges, um, both technical and, and especially non-technical, cultural integration, um, you know, processes, process change and, and um, training, all these things are, you know, go into an enterprise solution. It's not just, you know, the one, uh, the one model that outperforms the prior model um, and fitting into what's been done prior because everyone at this point has, has done some experimentation um, in this space. So I think for us, um, you know, in terms of choosing tools, it really comes down to um, really like, you know, any project <laughs> you would do really in any industry um, where once you have a clear understanding of what the opportunity space is, then you can go about uh, identification of, of the right tooling. Um, for us, a lot of times that discussion starts with data foundations. So developing a, a data uh, corpus a data platform that you can start to build not one, but many different um, solutions against. And that also has technical and non-technical elements to it where coming up with good data definitions, what is a customer? When do we count a sale? Um, what are my geographies? Having those be uh, aligned and harmonized, especially you get into big multi-brand organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, you know really important because if you can get that right, build a data dictionary, you have good ownership, stewardship, data governance, you trust the latency that's in there. You have data quality, you know, checks set up. Now you've got a, a, a nice uh, platform. Um, and then the data product piece, um, you know, is, is a much uh, lighter lift. Um, so anyone who's listening, who's ever worked with data knows that you're spending 90% of your time doing the cleansing and preparation. And that last 10% is, is really the fun part. And now with the cloud technologies, um, you know, it's really open to, open to anyone. That's interesting. You, you talk about things like building data dictionary and, and uh, 
making sure your data quality is high, cleansing your data. Those are things that um, they're not really necessarily about AI. I mean, if I just want to do some reporting, these are That's necessary right. steps as well. Yeah, uh, and, yeah, and, and very but, human intensive. I mean, AI has uh, you know human foundations all over the place. I mean, the the labeling of data that goes into LLMs. There's a lot of ethical conversation right now about are these people getting you know paid well? Are they not exposed to too much harmful content? Um, it, are they getting a fair fair share of economic value that's coming out? So there's a, a whole bunch of ethical questions just in thinking about uh, AI and data data labeling. Um, internally in an organization, there's also still a lot of heavy lifting to do in terms of, you know, data slinging, normalization, cleansing, and so forth. Um, but I think one of the, the other messages I'd put out there is that everyone feels like uh, their data is not ready, <laughs> you know, and actually the more, the more big and successful a company is, the more they're sort of embarrassed by the state of the quality of their data. <laughs> it's the number one showstopper for consultants is, we, we're going to have to take two years to really get ourselves ready to do what you guys want to do. And, and, and hmm. my response is always, you'll never be there because as you grow and acquire brands and you have new data sources to ingest and you want to enrich with third party and, you know, all of these things, you're, the challenges will just continue to grow. So the, the, you know, the, the thing to do is really to get ahead of it and, and abstract a level and develop, you know, governance process that can then manage that chaos. Um, and I think that's a real, um, that's a, a hard thing to to sit with when you're trying to get to the thing we were talking about before, which is the most accurate um, response based on the highest quality data. That's an interesting response. I hadn't heard that before, that uh, com companies are reluctant to use their data because they don't think it's good enough. But uh, but maybe maybe talking about probabilities and saying, we're not, we're not looking for 100%, we're looking for, uh, we, we're looking for a, a solution that we know the probability of. That's so right. In that case, good enough is good enough. Yeah, and right there, I think you've you've said something which implies a, a level of data maturity that not everyone in the organization may have. So data literacy programs inside of organizations um, and the culture change that comes with digital transformation and especially data-driven digital transformation is, is really critical because if you didn't have trustworthy data, and then you walk into an executive meeting with a data point, and then that that data point is called into question and you don't have the provenance to back up. You can't mm. tell the story of how we got to where we got to. Then you forever sort of tainted the program of data inside that organization. And it will give opportunity to sort of the, the shoot from the hip type executives who we've probably all worked with before. Sure. It gives them more confidence that, yeah, the data will say say one thing, but I really know because I've been out to 12 sites and, and I really understand <laughs> it, which is invaluable. But the, the best examples are when you can marry those two approaches, bring the anecdotal, bring the intuition along with the data, and then move forward as an organization. Got it. Uh, there's been so much uh, hype around artificial intelligence, certainly in the last couple of years. Um, uh, is it is AI suitable for every organization uh, or for every problem in an organization? Absolutely not. I mean, you're kind of leading me with that question. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, th I think it's uh, every organization, probably there is an opportunity. And I would say that all the way down to the, the mom and pop shop, if I want to evaluate, um, you know, my sales and, and orders, there's there's opportunity there. And again, because of the cloud technologies that we have now, the accessibility is is 100% there. And you can... Um, you, you can train and extend existing large language models that took, you know, dollars that, you know, the mom and pop shop could never afford on their own, but now we can leverage those and we can extend that with our own data in order to answer, um, you know, answer questions better. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that there's always an opportunity for some form of, of AI, whether it's machine learning, you know, or, or generative AI, um, you know, but it's definitely not for, for every problem. And, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, I think more often than not, um, sort of the biggest places to get tripped up are where sort of the human factors aren't, aren't addressed. Um, the organization is not data driven today. It doesn't need to be, you know, AI savvy to be data driven. Um, there just has to be the, the lingering question always like, don't we have numbers on that? Shouldn't we be looking at that? Can that help inform our, our decision at this moment? Um, and if we don't have that, um, you know, sort of core curiosity, um, and and I'll say humility as well, because you, your assumptions always have to be challenged. Um, 
then uh, you know then then there's challenges in in deploying um, any AI, you know any any AI. Interesting. Um, is there are there things we haven't talked about that we should <laughs> on this topic? So oh, so many things. Well, we ta- we touched on the the ethics a bit. I think that um, you know again keeping in mind that uh, you know machine learning AI. Um, Gen AI is pointing towards an optimization. Um, what we don't think about enough as practitioners, and I'm certainly guilty of this myself, is the feedback loop. Because the data that we train our systems on is generated based on the system that that exists. As soon as we've deployed AI into any process, we've now altered that system and it's generating new data that will then be fed back into that system. And so as you do that, you start to refine towards, uh, you know, more and more point solutions and what you may lose in that process. If there's an over-reliance on the recommendation that comes out of either a predictive model, you know, or a Gen AI system, um, is we've lost the opportunity for the human to say, well, what about this thing over there? Like, we're not talking about that. We don't have any data on that geography yet, but I really want to explore our brand in that geography. Hmm. The AI system will never tell you to do that if you didn't have the data to guide it there. But if you think about it as a landscape that has several, you know, uh, maximums <laughs> and you're trying to get to those, those, you know, those, those mountaintops, you're going to miss it if you rely solely on AI, which will always take you back to more of the same. And so I think that, you know, overall, as we you know, sort of balance this pendulum swing and think about, you know, especially the balance between human influence and AI influence, um, we've got to have some real uh, intentional approaches to how we think about exploration, how we go out and try things that are, you know, not at all suggested uh, by the data, let alone, uh, you know, the, the Gen AI, such that we can create um, systems that are are truly creative, which means expanding the map, lighting up more of the map, identifying new opportunities, new markets, uh, you know, new <laughs> new pharmaceuticals and so forth. Can you tell me a little bit about the tools that you're using? <clears throat> sure. Um, yeah, we are uh, a, a partner with with Microsoft. Have been, um, I think, from the beginning. So we do a lot we of work. Appreciate that. <laughs> we do a lot of work with with uh, on Azure. Um, I have some background at Microsoft as well, and spent some time. So uh, you know, have have definitely explored and deployed a lot of tools. We start, you know, with uh, you know bringing people into Azure, landing data in the cloud. We think about uh, both uh, app migration and app modernization, um, and we also think about applications as a source of of data. So, um, you know, app services inside of Azure it's generating data that can then be used for AI processes um, inside. You know, the new you know, AI workshop being able to use that in order to bring in my own data, um, and I, I think that you know the overall outside of convenience, outside of of, of cost and optimization, all of that the security of what you can do um, with open AI models, with, uh, with Azure models inside a, a secure Azure environment, that, that's really the headline. And that's, I think, the, the thing that um, it's, a, it's a table stakes concept, but without it, none of this stuff would, would really work because you're now giving uh, you know, your data into a system that you know, sort of should, should have unfettered access, even at the document level, to all of that content. So um, security is paramount not only on um, you know, keeping the, the walls around the data, but also making sure that you have good process for you know, how and when things are going out based on that data, because your data will surprise you. <laughs> if you put in you know, every Word document and every PowerPoint your organization has ever made into an LLM and start asking questions, you might learn some things about your organization you didn't know. Um, and so the, the goal is how do you harness, harness that and make it uh, you know, give, your, give your employees superpowers versus generating new risk? Awesome. Well, Cameron, thank you very much. This is really educational. I appreciate your time. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, David. Great to be on. I always say at the end of my talks, do what you love and, and love what you do. And I think that's uh, you know well played out in the, the concept of technology and friends. My personal motivation is uh, find great technology and, and data and uh, work with people that, that you like uh, and you can't go wrong.